So, hello. Uh, my name is Jon Back, uh, and I'm here to present activity as ultimate particular of interaction design. And this work is written by Annika Wern and me, both from Uppsala University, and sadly Annika couldn't be here today. I believe she's on a laptop chatting with someone that I know. So in case you want to talk to her, she will hear the conversation and we can continue afterwards. So this paper is about design knowledge. And more specifically, it's about knowledge creation in interaction design. It's about how we express that design knowledge, uh, and it's about how we create, how we as researchers create uh, knowledge in research through design. And of course, knowledge creation has been discussed before. For example, Lövgren has discussed how we could express interaction design knowledge as intermediate level knowledge. So, as we do not have and never can have grand theories that work in all instances, or if we can, they seem to not be able to, to inform design. Therefore, we need concepts with certain qualities uh, that express knowledge on a more generic level than only individual cases, even though those, these will not always work. But they still can help to give a broader understanding. So that means that we are creating knowledge on multiple levels. So from the close to grand theories of how things work, like the concept of flow, uh, describing how people engage completely in something, through interaction design guidelines and design patterns behind such thing as uh, how we make a menu, down to represent representational artifacts uh, that embody a specific design concept. So this is the, the first computer mouse. So in a way, it's more than just a mouse. It's, it, it, imbinds this knowledge. Stoltemann introduced the term ultimate particulars to describe these individual design examples. So in interaction design, ultimate particulars are seen as embodying knowledge. And to present this intermediate level knowledge, this has often been presented as, as a concept plus examples related to that concept. And this combination of ultimate particulars and the concept is referred to by James Pierce as concept things. But interaction design is not about things. It's about how we interact with, with each other uh, and how this is influenced by things. So to let the things be what embody the knowledge runs the risk of focusing on that object instead of what we do when that object is around. And it, re and it risks us believing that the object creates what is happening, a form of technology determinism. We argue that an artifact can be used in multiple ways uh, and that we would gain from instead mainly documenting what people do. So instead of concept things, we would look at something like concept activities. So that means that instead of having conce a concept plus a bunch of things that represent this, we would have a concept plus a bunch of designed activities. So if we do this, what do we get? Well, we argue that this would change mainly two things. It changes the concepts that are produced in, in our research, and it changes the way they are documented. First, the concepts produced. As an example, in game design studies, we have a concept called second order design. This means that what somebody experienced from our design is not directly made by us. We can never create an activity, but only in ties for it to happen. Uh, and this slide is the fate model, with, which is my interpretation of uh, second order design. Uh, as an example in this one, if you have, the, uh, have a game, say Monopoly, most of you should be fam familiar with it. That game contains a board, it contains dice, it con contains a set of rules. But even though this is what we design, it is not what we're actually interested in. Instead, we're trying to create a certain experience through an activity performed by the player. But it's up to the users to do what they want with that game, and we can only entice them to do what we, what we want them to do. In the end, it is the player that decides what to do with that game. So with players taking this active role and always being part of creating their own experience, we cannot really talk about users, but instead they always turn into some form of co-producers. And there are examples of this in interaction design as well. In the paper, we 
mentioned trajectories and verbs, for example, and also the fate model from the previous page. Another common example, both inside in interaction design and in industry, is uh, scripts. Uh, in this case, this is a, ma is a theater manuscript. Uh, and of course, a theater manuscript tells who should do what in which order. But again, it is not the activity in itself. And it does not try to be. Uh, the script must be interpreted. And every time the play is played, it's going to be a little bit different from the previous time. The other uh, image here is a script for a semi-structured interview, which we also could be seen as a form of uh, activity design. One risk that should be mentioned uh, with activity-focused design is that, and scripts is, scripts is a good example of it, uh, is that they run a risk of trying to limit activity, to try to des design the activity directly. Uh, and from interaction design, we are quite used to, to co-producing together with, with uh, users in, in part participatory design. So this is something that we are quite, quite used to handle. Uh, so I think we are good people to solve that problem. We can see activity design in industry and implemented design today as well, uh, in that the, the thing need not be central. Uh, it need not be a stable design. Rather, today, things has become something that we can often change on the fly. Uh, and the design phase does not end until the end of the life cycle of the product. So this can see in, be seen in such examples and as the pervasive game momentum, where the game organizers were designing the game partly as it went on and changing things. We can see it in A-B testing, where two different groups of people see a slightly different version of the system, even though they feel they are, think they are getting the same experience. And then afterwards, we can see if they like the blue pill or the red pill the most. And the one they liked is the one they're going to get. And we see it in a such concept as the perpetual beta, uh, where an app gets new updates over time uh, according to how uh, how the usage changes. So, taken to its extreme, I could argue that artifacts are insignificant. So if interaction design is actually about interaction, and people are doing the exact same thing through two different artifacts, that artifact could, for all intents and purposes, be seen as the same. And the other way around, if two different activities uh, are enticed by the same artifact, uh, both of those activities are interesting in themselves as two different examples. In case you're wondering, that was your Twitter moment. The other part is documentation. This is Beatles impromptu rooftop concert in London, 30th of January, 1969. The band broke up in September the same year. It's Beatles' very last concert, and it was not sanctioned. In fact, they were hoping to get captured by the police. Except it isn't. This is a photo from that event. But the event itself was a unique and ephemeral event. It happened there, and it happened then. The event was heavily filmed and photographed. A select few journalists were forewarned and wrote about it. And while the film and the writing is not the event, they were essential in capturing it. Without the documentation, this event would not have been known today. And yet, the lasting material is not the event. It is a collection, and it is a subjective collection of it. Similarly, we need to capture the interaction and not only the artifact. And sometimes there might not even be an artifact to capture. This is Marquez Segura et al. Uh, when they, uh, in a presentation of a workshop with kids playing with a toy bomb.
In this instance, the bomb that the kid throws back and forth is just a soundtrack taking down to an explosion. Who holds the ball? Who wins? Who loses? It's all role playing. And it's a social understanding in the group. This could not be shown by giving you the artifact. So we need to document this through example Im images and videos. And the subjective experience of activity is important. And the subjective experience of you, for you as researchers may not be the same as the subjective experience of these kids. And actually, if I would give you that artifact, it was not even implemented. So you would basically get a ball on a string. And of course, there's a reason why uh, Michael Segura et al. has chosen this clip and not any other. It's carefully selected to get this message across of how this event happens. Uh, it's a curation process that is part of both analysis and, pres uh, and presentation. So with this clip, we can get an understanding of the bomb-throwing activity, while with another clip, we may not. So, to conclude. Unlike artifacts, activities cannot be shipped or presented. They are unique and they are different every time. But the interpretations and retellings of activities can be presented. And similarly, unlike artifacts, activities cannot be designed. They are created by the users every time they are performed. But we can entice certain activities through deliberate design work grounded in activity-centric concepts and approaches. And that is the ultimate particulars that we suggest should be presented. Thank you. You ended up the talk with uh, with uh, with documentation of activities. And for for artifacts, there have been suggestions to document uh, artifact kind of related knowledge with annotated portfolios, for instance. What kinds of suggestions would you have for documenting activities so that they would be easy to disseminate to to, for instance, the academic audience? We are talking about annotated portfolios in, in the paper. Yes. Uh, and and annotated portfolios is definitely one of those things that has a concept plus some, some yeah. artifacts. So, it, so it's definitely one of those activities plus things. Uh, and yeah, of course, it's not as easy. And, and, and this is a first step. So there will be, we, we will have to work on, on how to do this. But, but it starts in, in this selected. Uh, selected moments of videos and photos. Right. To, okay. and, and of course, those can, can be annotated as well. So it's, so it's so, so, uh, an annotated portfolio of, of annotation and, and documentation, video documentation, for example. Selected video doc documentation could be in such, such a solution. Okay, thank you. There's another question. Um, hello, if uh, design is about design ac activities, there are two slightly unrelated questions that spring to mind. Um, the, the first one is, to what extent um, design is about uh, designing the agency of, of the people who are going to experience that? And the second thing is, you showed several things that were events, and of course, the, the things that the people during these events did was not design, but the, ev the event itself at a more global level than the activity was to some extent organized. So is this an activity or design, or is this okay, I'm an event organizer, I'm creating a festival, and I'm doing another activity that is not exactly design. So these are my two questions. This is about an, an, an approach to, to design uh, to a large extent. So, so designing, uh, was it a festival you said? As an example. Yeah. Of course, fe uh, festival organizers are thinking about this, the, such subjects as what are people going to do, uh, how are they going to, perceive this musician, but also such, such thing as how does it feel to go through, or how should, should we get people to go through the line and, and end up in the right 
in, in the right line towards, towards the, the, the cashier, for example. So, so definitely organizing something like, like, uh, like an event contains a lot of, of this kind of thoughts. I think it's an area where we could, we could gain a lot of knowledge from, from looking at. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.